Well, guys, uh, it's a treat to have Craig Noblog here. Um, you guys have all uh, seen his resume, and uh, actually, many of you know about Craig. Um, the informal ways to know, you know, that, that you might associate Craig is, um, for example, uh, Amir did internship at ISI last year, and um, so Craig, uh, uh, you know, is a professor of computer science and spatial sciences at USC. Uh, he's director of one of the um, uh, uh, you know, divisions within ISI uh, for, uh, you know, Division of Information Sciences, sorry, uh, Intelligence System Division. And um, uh, as you might have seen, uh, he has worked uh, extensively on various um, topics that uh, you guys, some of you work on. That includes schema ontology alignment, uh, extracting data from the web, and many other things. Uh, he is fellow of AAA AI. Um, uh, he has been fellow of AAA well before I was uh, appointed or elected, and uh, and also uh, uh, let's see, trustee of Ichkai, and so on. So we look forward to that. Uh, we are getting to hear a keynote without assisting for some event. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, Amit. So in fact, this is the same talk I'm giving tomorrow. So if you have to be coming to the symposium tomorrow, then. Uh, Twice, but uh, you're welcome to hear. So, anyway, okay. So I'm going to talk about work we've been doing at USC. So the title might talk from artwork to summer text, uh, lessons learned in building knowledge graphs using semantic web technologies. Since the symposium tomorrow is focused on sort of the semantic web, I really wanted to provide some perspective on what I think are sort of the things that work well, things that don't work well, with respect to the kinds of work that we do at USC. So just to give you a little bit of back to my lab. So these are some of the people that actually work on uh, what we call the Center on Knowledge Graphs. Uh, so Min is sitting here in the front, so a PhD student who works on our projects. And some, some, some work that I'll talk about today. Uh, you can see there's a number of other faculty, uh, researchers, and programmers, as well as all of these uh, students that all. So these are all in your part of the center, or they're all in part of the center. Yeah. So this is all part of the Center for Knowledge Graphs. All, all uh, part of our group. So about 48 people total now. Okay. So and to give you just a sense. I mean, these are all the different projects that we currently have ongoing, so there's quite a few different projects, and I'm going to just touch on probably a handful of them today. I don't have time to talk about them all, uh, but I'll talk on the talk specifically about the examples that sort of tie into the work uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so what's our goal? We want to basically take all this data that's out there, it might be on the web, uh, databases, spreadsheets, uh, online resources, or whatever, uh, but, you know, out there it can be hard to query, analyze, and visualize, and then turn it into something that's sort of well organized. So we have a system called DIG, which is sort of uh, our overarching sort of project to sort of build these knowledge graphs, and then we apply it into lots of different application domains. But the idea is to turn it into something that's clean, organized, and linked together so that you can actually use this data for some kind of application. Okay. Uh, so, as part of this talk, I, I sort of came up with sort of a set of questions I'd like to try to address uh, at the end of the talk, but I'll, I'll pose the questions at the beginning. So, and I think they're sort of high-level questions that we've wrestled with in terms of the, the kind of work that we're doing. So let me just quickly go through them. Uh, so the first one is, you know, where should the actual data for the semantic web come from, right? So, you know, is it a triple store, link data, schema.org? I mean, wh where's this information actually available that we're going to work with? Um, what's the, you know, what we might consider the best representation of the data, right? So if you're going to build some application and you need an ontology, you know, do you want the most fine-grained detailed ontology that you can find that fully captures every detail? Or do you want some more abstract kind of ontology? The uh, third question is, how do we actually deal with this problem of sort of incomplete and incorrect information, right? Are you going to manually curate the data? It could be a lot of information. Uh, some kind of automated data cleaning techniques. I mean, there's a whole range of things that you could do here. So what would we actually do with that? And then finally, how are we going to actually organize and store this data for efficient access and analysis and uh, whatever you're going to do with information? So, so this is actually important because a lot of the applications that we deal with uh, are very large. And so you're dealing with very large quantities of data. And so uh, it could be a challenge to actually manage that. So now I'm going to go through sort of the organization of the talk itself. So what I want to do today is talk about some of the steps that we use in terms of building a knowledge graph. Uh, so in particular, I'm going to focus on sort of the core ones here in the middle. That's not to say that the other ones are not important. They are very important. Uh, I just don't have time to talk about them all in, my, in the time I have allotted. So I'll talk about feature extraction, alignment, entity resolution, and then sort of how we then turn that into some kind of knowledge graph. Then there's still the question of, okay, how do we query it, visualize, and uh, do analysis on it? And there's the important problem of where all the information comes from. Uh, but I won't address those today. Okay. 
so, okay, so let me start with feature extraction. And what I want to do in this talk is I'm going to basically motivate the different pieces of work I'm going to describe by specific applications that we've been building. So in this application, uh, one of the problems we've looked at is this problem of, of illegal arms sales. And this is a problem that, uh, you know, we discussed with uh, ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, and they're particularly worried about uh, illegal gun sales. And this happens on the Internet, not surprisingly. And the way this happens is that people buy and sell guns on the Internet, and some of those are, sales are legal and some are illegal. And typically, the ones across state lines are not typically legal. Uh, but finding them can be very hard, because what happens is that there are actually hundreds of these websites where people buy and sell guns. This is just, you know, a handful of these sites. Uh, and the challenge is that each of these websites, you know, has you know, many, many guns listed on them, and people are buying or selling them. And so the problem for ETF is finding the ones that are illegal is very challenging because there's so much data, there's so much information that's being passed, and people are not buying and selling on the same, the same guns on the same websites. So we looked at this problem of being able to sort of automate the extraction and alignment of this data so that, you know, that you could put this data together much more rapidly. Right. And so I'm going to talk about uh, a particular t example. So uh, here's one website. So this is uh, 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 a website that has a listing of uh, a particular gun for sale. Uh, and the type of information that you want to get off this is really the structured kind of information, right? What are they actually selling? You know, how much are they selling it for? Uh, what's the description of it, which is down here? Where was it listed? Who listed it? What's the location? So it's a bunch of sort of structured information. It's structured because, you know, every page on that particular website looks the same or very similar to all the other pages. Uh, and so one of the challenges then is, okay, could we actually uh, figure out how to do this extraction of the data on uh, so this is based on some work that's being done by uh, one of our colleagues, Steve Minton and Edward Furlake. Uh, and so the basic idea behind this approach is to start out with the set of pages that are on a given website. So you spider the site, you pull them all the pages. Uh, one of the challenges with that, though, is that these may be of very many different types, right? So there's some pages that are going to correspond to the actual listing information, but there could be many other types of information. And so the first thing that they do in the work here is to basically take these pages and then organize them by the underlying template in the page. And they figure out the template by looking at sort of the, uh, the, the pieces of um, uh, data that's common across pages. And what they're looking for is sort of the, for the, the visual information, so the information that you can actually see on the page, not, not the information in the HTML. Uh, the idea is to basically figure out, okay, which, which of that information is common across all pages, in which case you ignore it. And then which of those pieces of information only occur on a few pages, and you ignore those. And then you look at the remaining sets of pieces of information that are visual, and then you essentially do the clustering. So you take all those pages, and then you group them by the common information across the page. So, and this is nice because one of the problems I've seen in past work on sort of automatic extraction, they assume that all the pages are of the same type. Okay, and here it's basically figuring out, okay, what are the different page types that are shown in different colors? And then once you do that, then you can essentially build an extractor for each of the different page types. And the way you build an extractor is sort of a similar kind of idea, which is just sort of say, okay, now I'm going to look for sort of the commonality across the pages that are within each type. Okay, and I'm going to look for some sort of core piece of information that's sort of different, that's, that's the same across every page, and then you can use that to essentially decompose the page, uh, and then you can do this process recursively to essentially figure out the underlying structure of those pieces. So, so when you say visual, you mean the nested structure? In, in well, page? when I say visual, I just mean the, the stuff that you see, the text, the text information you see on the page. So it's not, it's not trying... Not tags, per se. It's not, no, it's not worried about tags or anything like that, so it ignores all the tags and stuff. It's just looking at the information that's actually shown on the page itself and uses that to, to then figure out how to uh, uh, build the template. I mean, so first to do the classification uh, or the clustering of the pages and then how to build the actual template of the pages. Okay, so once you build those extractors, then they can take that. So they can do that in the software that's actually part of DIG, so the work, their work has actually been incorporated directly into our, our larger framework here. And what happens in the system then is it's able to then figure out uh, the common information across those pages. For example, here's the description. And these are different pages in the columns. These are the different types of information in each row. And so here you can see the description. And it's able to successfully extract the description off every page. Or uh, here's like the, the titles of the pages, you know, what information is being sold, and so on. Um, and the key idea here is that this can be done you know, in a completely automated fashion, right? That you can feed in this set of pages, uh, it groups them into the different groups, and then comes out with the structure. 
Now, as you can see here, it doesn't actually know what this information is, right? So this information uh, is just the extracted data. So in the next step, the feature alignment one I'll talk about next, you still have to figure out, okay, how this, how this data that comes out of this particular website is going to relate to all of the other websites. Uh, once you can do this automatically, then you can build a system that sort of scales so that you can put all this data together. So this just gives you a sense of how well this is doing. So uh, these are the different fields, title, description, seller, date, and so on. And then this is sort of how well they're doing on the set of sample out of 50 pages, how well they do out of those pages. You know, can you actually extract the correct information of a case? In many kind of cases, it's hard to get sort of the perfect extraction because it may extract a little bit too much, a little bit too little. Uh, but if, it, if you include sort of the one that's close enough, the, the data would be useful. So you have some partial information or maybe some extra information. Uh, then you can see it does, it does quite well in most of the fields. Okay, so that's the, sort of the work on extraction. Uh, the next step in sort of the uh, task of building the knowledge graphs is this feature alignment problem. And this is a problem we've worked on for quite a long time now. Um, and, and let me first start out with sort of a motivating example here. So in this case, uh, this is an application we built for creating knowledge graphs for predicting cyber attacks. And the challenge here is to pull data from very diverse sources of information. So we have uh, the dark web where we have marketplaces and forums, we have blogs, uh, Twitter, we have social media data. Uh, CPEs and CVEs are just the data that's published by NIST about particular uh, vulnerabilities uh, in software that's uh, so there are particular types of vulnerabilities and particular software that's vulnerable to uh, cyber attacks. Uh, news data, conference information, these are conferences about cyber, uh, cyber related uh, conferences. Things like Microsoft bulletins, abuse at CH, where uh, um, these are certain kinds of attacks that get uh, posted there. And the idea is that all of this information has to be integrated together, and we do that uh, using a system we built called Karma. And, you know, it takes in, into account some uh, domain ontology that we've created for the cyber domain. And then all of this data, and then we create essentially the knowledge graph of all this data. We then take the, the information that gets used uh, to make predictions about things. So there's a variety of forecasting algorithms that then run over this data and then try to make predictions. I'll give you an example of one, one particular use case that we're working on now is looking at in the news when uh, a company announces a layoff. And then there's very negative sentiment sort of in the social media that people are very upset about this layoff. Uh, that can actually be an indicator that the company is likely to be attacked. So then you can actually make predictions that, okay, this company could be vulnerable because people are really upset about this really well. And this really happens. Um, uh, okay, so the, the domain ontology for this uh, is sort of shown here just visually, right? So it has things like uh, exploits and vulnerability and security updates and blogs. It's so all of the data that comes from all those different sites has to then get sort of aligned to this domain ontology so that we can actually uh, reason about the data across the different sites. Uh, so in total in this ontology, there's about 28 classes that we're using and about 97 properties. And it's based on, we start with schema.org, because schema.org is a nice ontology that has a lot of sort of very general information that's, that, that's applicable here. And then we extend it with some additional classes and properties for the specific domain. So that's the ontology for this. Uh, as I mentioned, we use a system called Karma uh, to do the alignment of each of those different kinds of sources to this domain ontology. Uh, so karma can take in a variety of sources, so it can have relational sources, hierarchical ones, which could be things like uh, JSON or XML, uh, so online services, uh, and then it also takes as input the ontology, in this case the cyber ontology I just described. And then the idea is that we then have to do this mapping of the data uh, to the domain ontology, and this is what's shown here is a, a screenshot of Karma with the, with the actual mapping here on the top, uh, and the data is on the bottom. Um, and then once, once that mapping is, is determined in Karma, uh, then you can take that data and output it in RDF, which most of you are probably familiar with, uh, which is this triple uh, representation where you have subject, uh, predicate, and then object, which are related. Um, and you can also output in an, another representation of R RDF called JSON-LD, which is a JSON representation, basically, of, R of RDF. So it's, you, know, you can represent the equivalent type of information. It's just in JSON, which is a format that many people outside the semantic web community are comfortable with. And many tools actually work on that. Okay, so uh, here's an example in, in terms of the mapping. So let's say that you have a data set here that has information about posts. Uh, so these are actually posts on some uh, dark web form, for example. 
Uh, and then it would actually, in the process of using karma, you would actually map it to this domain ontology, right? So you have to figure out, okay, how does each column of information relate to the classes and properties in the ontology? And what's the relationship between these different columns of information? Um, and so here, the first step in this process is identifying sort of what are called the semantic types, right? So maybe this is the text of the post, and this may be the language and the topic, uh, the name of the vulnerability that it relates to, and maybe the use or the person. And so we have to worry about how to actually figure out these automatically. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we have the relationships. So the other piece of this is we want to understand that, oh, okay, this post, you know, has a topic uh, which is shown here, and it's in a particular language, and the author is that person over there. So, you know, it's not enough just to sort of say, oh, okay, this is the type of information in this column. We want to understand uh, at a deeper level how all this information sort of interrelates, so that you can write queries against the data. Um, okay, so here's an example model. So once you're done, maybe you, you've uh, uh, done all the work to take, take posts, and in Karma you've mapped it, but this is just a graph that sort of shows uh, what the final model might look like. So it's fairly complicated, so it, it can take some time to actually build these, um, I guess what you call a mapping for this. Uh, once you've done that, then you have, uh, in this particular application, then we would have this cyber knowledge graph dashboard, which then allows you to go and explore the data. So now here in this dashboard, you can go and say, okay, I'm interested in uh, these different types of things. You probably can't see these in the back, but these have things like malware, vulnerability, attack, blog. So you can query these different things, or you can query all of them. Uh, you can put in sort of search terms here, and then specify how many results you want, and then this is just uh, the initials of the results here, so you can export them. Yes? So once you map the data, as you showed, to the ontology on the bottom, do you call that an analogy graph here, or not? No, that's just one step. So the, I mean, the, if you go back to my sort of graph, right, so there's sort of the, the I mean, it's one step in the mapping. It's an important step. Uh, here. So we're here in the sort of the process, right? So to get to the knowledge graph, which is over here, right, you really have to go through the different steps here, which is the data has to come some, from somewhere. I talked about one approach to doing feature extraction. So there's many approaches to feature extraction, but I just talked about doing it from structured data. Feature alignment step is, okay, how do you actually do the mapping to the, to the ontology? Then you have to do any kind of linking that you're going to do on the, and then turning it into some kind of yeah. So, given the colloquial, basically, language of the social media and foreign data that we are dealing with, how challenging do you think it is to apply a specific, ex I mean, exactly keyword-based matching or any alignment that you are you may think of it for using it? I mean, how challenging it would be when it comes to free language to capture all this useful information out of the language? Oh, I think it's very challenging. I mean, there's lots of, uh, people spend a lot of time on doing the extraction from sort of text information and so on. And one of the things, for example, we haven't, in, in, in this particular application I'm talking about now, the, the one for predicting cyber attacks, a lot of what we've been using um, has focused on uh, taking certain kinds of keywords that often get used when discussing cyber attacks. For example, CVE numbers are particularly useful in terms of figuring out and doing alignment across different sources and figuring out patterns in the data. So, for example, even in Twitter and news and on blogs, people often talk about CVE numbers, which talk about, which refer to particular uh, uh, vulnerabilities or exploits. That so, for example, you develop a lexicon and then you start the, the matching. Is this the way that you I, I don't you develop a lexicon of these uh, terms, and then you do the matching with the ontology concepts. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's I mean so that's the idea in terms of you know just building the knowledge graph, which is we've identified what we think are sort of the critical types of information that we want and the types of information related to those, and then done the mapping so that you know the information when it comes from different sources is using the same terms. And, and all of the matching so far is it has been done in elastic search. So I mean. Uh, virtuous or these traditional tools haven't been employed yet. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, we've used both, so I'll get back. To I'll get to that a little bit later. But we've used both uh, uh, triple stores and uh, Elasticsearch, and we've played around with various other graph databases and so on. Um, okay, so let me go on from here. So okay, so let me spend a minute and talk to you about the last, you know, the you know this part here, which is that. 
Okay, so we need to do this mapping of the data to the to the ontology, and one of the one of the things that Karma helps with is this is to actually help you build these semantic descriptions or semantic mappings of the data. Okay, and it, and essentially once it has that, I mean this is it, it's essentially using this to ha as one step in terms of creating the knowledge graph. Right? So it's it's you can think of it as the thing that's actually normalizing all the terms so that they're all aligned to the same scheme or the same. So I'm going to just very give you a high level view of how we do that mapping or how we try to automate that mapping in Karma. Uh, so this is based on work that uh, 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 one of my PhD students did, uh, where the idea was you start with some sample of the data set that you're going to, to map. So some data set is very large, so you don't necessarily want to load the entire data set because it's just taking long. Some domain ontology. Uh, and then if, if there's previous mappings that have already been done, then those can be used as input to help constrain or, or uh, bias the, the mappings that used. And the first step is learning the semantic types, which is actually a topic that Min has worked on. Uh, and then after we sort of identify the semantic types, then the other part is to actually construct a, a graph of the data with respect to the ontology, and then generate a set of candidates and, and evaluate them. And that then becomes the sort of that proposed model of the system that we use for the mapping. Uh, so just to give you a sense of how this works, so the, learning the semantic types, this is a challenging problem because we wanted something where you could actually learn from a small number of examples, because many times you don't have lots of data or you don't uh, have lots of uh, labeled data. Uh, and you want to be able to distinguish not just string data, which tends not to be hard to, that hard to distinguish, but also numeric data, which is, is much more challenging. Uh, and then you want something that you can learn this quickly and make it very scalable to large numbers of semantic types. So as the application grows, you know, you want something that's going to scale up the application. Um, so the basic approach is the following, which is, and this is based on, on Min's work here, which is uh, what you're going to do is you have several different sources and you're going to initially give it the actual labels for those sources. So this is the training phase where you say, okay. This is, uh, and this comes from a, a simple soccer domain where you integrate a bunch of soccer data. So maybe you have, in source one, you have some information about a player, and what you have is his name and his height. And in source two, you have, also have players, but in this case, all you have are the names. Uh, and then the way this works, what happens is you're going to train a classifier. So this is the training phase, where first we identify a set of sort of generic features. These are features like... Uh, Jacquard similarity or cosine similarity or TFID of cosine similarity. So you have a, a whole variety of features, that you, general features that you can use to compare uh, two different uh, pieces of information or two different, you can think of it as columns of information. Uh, and so what happens here is that uh, you, would, you would provide uh, this example as training data and you say, okay, this is the name and this is the name. So the system would then uh, train the system using a classifier to, uh, based on the set of features. So it would compare, it would compare this, set, this column of information here and this column of information here, compute all the features. So I only have two features listed here, but you'd have a whole set of features that would include Jacquard and cosine and all the other features that you had. Uh, and that becomes a positive example for the classifier. And then this column here and this column, we know are not the same, so that becomes a negative example. And you compute the set of features for those. And so you train the classifier to, to essentially look at the combination of all these features so then it can sort of take all the features into account whenever it's comparing two columns of data and then make a prediction about whether or not it thinks uh, a new example. So here, let's say I have a new example that the system has been trained on. Uh, now I can compare this column to this one, I compare this column to this column, uh, and it feeds in those numbers and it says, okay, in, in this case, uh, you know, it's the same as uh, the name, because it turns out this looks a lot like names, uh, and it has a very low probability of uh, this column being the same as this one. So the idea is uh, you're essentially uh, training a general classifier uh, based on the combination of sort of features that can be used to compare both string data and numeric data, and then applying it on uh, to essentially be able to compare one column with another, uh, with you know a new data set that has a bunch of related columns of information. And this it works well because it's very scalable. You you have to tell you have to give the system examples of each new type of information that it hasn't seen before, but you don't have to retrain the classifier. So you can essentially uh, uh, provide the information to the system and uh, provide new data to the system and then run this and give you, give you uh, good predictions on that. The second step uh, is to 
uh, now we have to figure out the relationships between these columns. So if you assume that you know, we've first identified the, the semantic types or the semantic labels on the data, that would correspond to, in this graph, the yellow nodes. Okay? And this, this graph here is constructed from the ontology, where what's happened is we simply take the ontology, look at all the ways that all those different semantic types could actually be connected to each other uh, in the data set. Uh, we assign some weights to the different uh, 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 links here, based on the different types of links that are there in the, in the ontology. Uh, and then we run what's called a Steiner tree algorithm on this, which is an algorithm that's going to find the least cost, well, it's an approximation algorithm that's going to find the least cost way to actually uh, connect up all those nodes. Because presumably, if the data's in the same table or the same uh, uh, data structure, uh, presumably it's, uh, it's related in some way. Okay. And so this might come up with some proposed initial model. But one of the things we don't assume in, when we map data using Karma is that it can always figure out these relationships automatically. Because sometimes there just is not enough information in the data set to figure it out. So the user can then interact. There's a user interface the user can interact with, uh, change some of the links and so on. And so in this case, maybe they've, they've indicated, as, you know, a, uh, in red here, it shows, shows several links that the user's changed. And then once it, the system has that, it says, OK, now I understand what the graph is. Uh, and it can it can automatically generate the uh, the final sort of mapping for this data set, right? And what and one of the nice things that Karma does is it doesn't just generate the data in RDF. What it does is it actually generates the mapping file, which is in uh, R two RML, which is a W three C standard to represent the actual mapping. So then you can actually take the mapping, apply it to the full data set, uh, and generate RDF for case numbers. Okay. So that's that's how we do the mappings. Uh, I want to just quickly uh, describe sort of another project that we did uh, where you know, the mapping was actually a big part of the project. So this is a project called the American Art Collaborative, which is a consortium of 14 American art museums, where what they wanted to do was to actually publish their data. They were really excited about being able to publish all their metadata about their artwork and to do it as linked data. So in the, it turns out that in the cultural heritage community, uh, they're very, very excited about uh, the semantic web and linked data. Uh, and so they're, they're, uh, everyone wants to have their data mapped. And so our goal was to build what's called five-star linked data for these museums, which means that we both had to align all the data and then link it to other sources. Uh, and then in the process, one of our goals was to actually create the tools uh, to support the construction of linked data, to make it easy. So we've done a lot of refinements in terms of common make this easy. Yes? So is there a way that you're dealing with uh lexical variation between these names of relations. For example, you would find in one data set that relationship is different, like the actual wording of it, the lexical variation between these. So how are you dealing with that, for example? Yeah, so we don't depend on, when we're, we're looking at the mapping of the data sources, uh, we're looking at the, both the content and the names of the information. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't map a data set just based on the relation name on the, on the column. So it's one of the features that comes into account, and that turns out to be useful because sometimes the data looks very similar. So if we might have two columns of data, one that has birth dates and one that has death dates. Well, they both look like dates, and it's hard to distinguish them. It turns out, though, that the, uh, the terminology at the top might actually help you differentiate those two. Uh, but we don't depend just on the naming information, right? So we actually depend very, very much on the content. Content plays a big role. Okay, so in this, then we want to basically create this linked data, uh, which is a which is a really a knowledge graph uh, for all these museums. And so we have to have the input data from the museums. An example model. So we have data from 14 museums. Here's an example model for one museum. But this is just just want to give you a sense. Okay, this is uh, the data that has been mapped to a, a domain ontology called CDOC CRM, which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a widely used cultural heritage ontology that, that's very popular in the sort of cultural heritage community. Uh, it's quite complicated. So it has, you know, this actor has a end of existence, which is a time span, and uh, they, you know, the guy died, but uh, mm -hmm. they, <laughs> they really make it's it. The end of existence is that. <laughs> uh, and so they can make it very complicated. Uh, so here's the full model for that data source, right? So you can see it has lots of different pieces to it. Um, the data itself, uh, there's quite a bit of data. So there were something like 76 files. We built 99 mappings because many times one file might get, have multiple mappings because it has uh, different types of information. The, the number I wanted to point out is the one way over here on the bottom, this, uh, which is the number of commits. And that, this, the reason I just want to point that out, there's 4,636 commits. These are commits on GitHub. And the reason I just want to point that out is 
every time someone updates the model for one of these for one of the museums, there's a new commit. And so the reason I just want to point that out is that uh, and this was a project where we had students do all the mapping of the data and stuff. But you can see that it took a long time to actually get the final product where uh, the data was really good and correctly mapped and so on. So uh, I'll come back to that point of that number. Uh, one of the problems that came up was getting all of the data mapped consistently across all these sources to this ontology was really hard. Right? And it was hard because the ontology is very complicated. There's many different ways you could actually interpret the ontology. And in fact, we even had experts that would actually, uh, you know, they would actually look at the final mappings that we would build. These were CDOC CRM experts, you know, experts in ontology. Uh, and they would proceed to have long, like 20 message discussions in the forums about what the right way to map the data was. Right? So even the experts wouldn't agree. Uh, so one of the things that actually came out of the project, which I think was quite useful, which was that finally uh, we got the experts to sort of sit down and write, uh, write out or generate a set of what are called target mappings, right? To sort of say, okay, if you're going to map this type of data, this is what it should look like in the model, right? So then all the students could actually look at that and sort of say, oh, okay, I see how I'm supposed to map this data and map it that particular way. Uh, and then in this mapping validation tool, then it, once you map it and, you look, and you've generated the data, uh, it's a little hard to see it here, but you can actually then run queries. So here it'll actually, you can enter an entity here, and then if it's mapped correctly, when you go, you know, if you map the classification information correctly, it'll run the query that corresponds to that data and bring up the data, and so then the correct information will actually appear there. So it gave us a way to actually ensure that was right. So I mean, part of the reason there were so many commits in that data was that it took us a long time, like a year, before we finally realized that, okay, we needed some additional structure to get, get this uh, data mapped into consistent. Um, we did finish the project, so now there's, this just shows sort of the total number of uh, entities, right, constituents, which are the artists, 52,000 artists, 153,000 objects, and it generated about uh, almost 10 million triples, right, in terms of the actual data. So it's big, but not huge, uh, uh, but quite a, quite a bit of data, but it took, took a while, uh, about 18 months to do the project in terms of aligning the, all the data that on trial. Okay. That brings me to the next topic, which is the entity resolution. So here, uh, one of the big challenges is um, uh, dealing with sort of complicated data. And so um, uh, one of the issues here, so, so here's a set of, uh, uh, just a, a very simple example, which we're trying to align data from products, right? And so we call this, this is work on what's called collective entity resolution. And this is based on Lin Hong Zhu's work, which was published in ISWC 16. Uh, and the idea, the challenge that we're looking at here is how do you identify and link sort of the same real world entities across data sets, and especially when you have sort of very uh, noisy and inconsistent data. But so here's the here's just an example of the problem, which is I've got you know five different products themselves, and each of these products have different attributes, right? So this is a multi-type graph where you've got uh, the actual uh, product itself, then you've got the price of the product, the manufacturer of the product, and the description. So you could imagine you could expand this and have even more attributes than this. Um, and the end result is that you want to figure out that, okay, maybe product one and product two are the same, and product four and product five are the same. Uh, but the challenge here is that uh, when you look at this data, so if you look at, you know, sort of the manufacturer, price, title, well, one thing is that, okay, some of the information may be missing. So this is a common issue that comes up in many of the kinds of graphs we build. Or you have here where you have uh, multiple values, right? So you might have, for this one product, you have several different values because for whatever reason you, you got the data from some source that has multiple instances for it. Um, and, uh, uh, and then if you look at sort of the traditional approach for doing sort of pairwise entity matching, which is you have this, you, know, you need to come up with some kind of score, right? So you need to come up with sort of an overall score for saying, okay, we're going to decide that, you know, the two products are the same if the general score is at least 0 0.5 and the distance at least zero, between the prices at least 0 0.2 and the Chakar distance is 0.3, right? And so then you just said you have some overall acceptance threshold and you say, okay, then these things are matched. But this is challenging because now what happens, how do you deal with the fact that, okay, I've got some blank information here, I've got multiple values there, uh, and then it doesn't work. Uh, so we came up with sort of a different approach based on what's called graph summarization, where the idea is you start with the, the same kind of uh, multi-type graph here. Uh, and instead of trying to do pairwise comparison between the entities, you look at sort of more holistically in terms of trying to match all the information together and do it sort of uh, as one process. 
So to do this, we have some kind of similarity function. And we've experimented with different kinds of similarity functions that you could use here. But you can basically just plug in your favorite one. Uh, and you use this similarity function to essentially do groupings of nodes, right? And so you're going to group by type. Uh, so here you see that, okay, this, this set of descriptions might get grouped together because they're closer, more close related, and this set gets grouped together. Uh, and maybe you have, you know, these prices, because they're fairly close together, get grouped, and these look close. Uh, you know, these are the, uh, uh, the mix factors. And so you have, you know, based on the, the similarity function, you have what we call these super nodes, which are sort of the grouping, the initial grouping of the different types of nodes. Um, and then, based on these super nodes, you can sort of think of, we have these links, right? So these are sort of the overall links that connect up uh, the different super nodes based on how the, sort of, the, all the links in between the individual uh, pieces of information are connected. Uh, and then what we can do is we can take these super links uh, if we just expand on an example, so this, I'm just taking one example from the graph here, and we just drill into that. Look at this one, okay? And then we can use this to actually predict links in the original graph, right? So you have this, you have this, this uh, grouping of product four and product five together, and you have these uh, manufacturers grouped together, and maybe that product over here. And so, given the super links, right? Now you can say, okay, if 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 this uh, if this is the only thing I know about these the way these are connected, then I would predict. Uh, a bunch of additional links, right? I would predict that uh, product four was connected to Bosch here, right? And, uh, uh, and you can see that, you know, basically just expanded all the possible links. Uh, and so then the idea to refine this graph is to take a look at the, um, uh, which of the links in the original graph that you correctly predicted, and then see if you can then refine the groupings to improve the predictions, right? So now I can sort of say, okay, I can take this and I can divide uh, this set of manufacturers into two. One that's Bose and Bose Electronics, the other one Bosch, which is actually a dishwasher manufacturer. Uh, and if I do that, if I, if I divide up these two groupings, then I end up with a much better prediction, right? So now this predicts the link which is there, and this predicts these two links, uh, which are both the original graph. So you can sort of go through this refinement process to uh, come up with sort of the, uh, this graph summarization, right? It's a way of sort of summarizing. Uh, this result works quite well. So there were some results here presented in the paper on this topic. Uh, so COSUM P was the name of the system. And there are two rows for COSUM, which are one is B and one is P. They just have to do with just two different similarity metrics that were used in the system. Uh, and compared to uh, the other systems that are sort of close related, some of these were doing graph summarization, some of them were doing uh, more traditional kinds of link, uh, record linkage stuff. And you can see on almost all the different domains. So there are three domains, author, paper, and product. And this uh, reports precision, recall, and F measure. And pretty much across the board, it's able to outperform uh, uh, the other systems. Okay. So that leads me to the last step here, which is the, the graph construction step. Um, uh, and here, let me describe another use case, which is actually uh, one that I think is probably one of our largest knowledge graphs we built which is one for combating human trafficking. And here, what we were doing was pulling in online web data uh, and then building an application that uh, allowed law enforcement to actually uh, much more effectively use the data that was based online to help them uh, uh, find traffickers. Okay, and um, here's the, just a screenshot from the end application that was built uh, using this knowledge graph. So this is something you give to law enforcement agencies where now they, if they had a phone number, so maybe they knew, knew a phone number for whatever reason, they could actually look up a phone number and they could actually find out sort of detailed information like when did the ads appear, what were the locations of the ads. The locations are very important because someone who's being trafficked is typically getting moved between different locations. Uh, and so being able to understand how someone's getting moved around over time is extremely important for law enforcement. Uh, and then you can see the details about um, all the different ads and you can drill down and get the information. Yes? But are the online websites that you use for this work? What are the online websites? Yeah, your data sources. Uh, back page is yeah. like the, one of the most common ones, although I don't know if it's still up at four other sections. But there's about a hundred. Uh, whether the same phone number appears in different sections of the uh, website that are dedicated for different cities. Yes, yeah, so we would, basically there's like a hundred different websites where we'd scrape data from, and uh, it would basically pull the data from all the different cities and for the U.S. Uh, build one giant knowledge graph out of it. And it would do it, uh, if, I think it's on the next slide actually, 
Uh, so th it would actually it pulled data from about a hundred million web pages more now I think it's because it's been running for quite a long, long while. Uh, it does live updates, so every hour it goes out and pulls in different additional pages. So because it adds about five thousand additional pages an hour. Uh, notice there's a lot going to be a lot of redundancy. Any change to a page and stuff would just get added back as another page. Um, then the system built on uh, you know to process all this data has about seven nodes for the actual uh, query engine that we're storing the data. And then for actually doing all the initial processing to create the knowledge graph, runs on about 20 nodes. But this was uh, successfully deployed and actually used to find victims and prosecute traffickers. So we talked to uh, people in the New York City Attorney General's office where they went through, oh, through multiple use cases where it's been extremely helpful for them because it allows them both to find the traffickers, it allows some of these organizations that look for runaways to help them find runaways. Uh, and then they said it was extremely effective in terms of helping them actually prosecute cases because in the middle of the prosecution, you know, the defense might come up with something that they could then refute by going to the knowledge graph and doing queries, getting the data to basically show that uh, what they're claiming was incorrect. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's nice to see it working in action. But let me talk a little bit about what's under the hood here. So the graph construction project it's, construction itself uh, is really trying to assemble this data so that we can efficiently query it and a analyze it. Uh, so because of the tools that were used for many of these projects here, uh, we represent all the data in JSON-LT. So as I mentioned, Karma can output the data in RDF or JSON-LT. JSON-LT is contained, still contains all the information that RDF has, but it's in JSON. Uh, but one of the reasons it's important to use JSON-LT is because we store all the data in Elasticsearch. So if you're not familiar with Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch is basically a a cloud-based search engine that's essentially a document store. Okay, it's built on top of Apache Lucene, which is uh, you know like a TF-IDF cosine similarity kind of search engine. Uh, but what what Elasticsearch provides is very clever indexing, and it very and, and they make it very scalable because it provides horizontal scaling, replication, load balancing. So if you have more data and you need more processing power, you can just add additional servers to the system. Uh, queries run very fast. I'll show you some of the numbers for that. Uh, but everything, the way to think about this, it's not really a database, it's a document store, right? And that's one of the reasons it can be so efficient, is because you're storing all the information as sort of individual documents that you can then query. Uh, and you can do sort of bulk loading, where you can load in sort of lots and lots of data, it takes some time. And then real-time updates, where you're actually adding in new information in real time to, to augment the knowledge graph. Um, one of the ways that we use Elasticsearch that makes it efficient is that we basically provide different views of the data. So based on how you're going to query the data, we can essentially pre-compute different views of the information. So this is essentially sort of saying, okay, I'm going to expand out this part of the graph and then include this set of information. And in, in this case, for the kind of queries you might do on the human trafficking domain, maybe there's some queries based on the services, some based on people, phone, and each one of these gives a different view. And that means that some of your data make it get replicated, so you might have different, you know, in this case you might have five different copies of your data, each organized in a different way. Uh, but the real benefit of that is in query time, and that you can run these queries uh, very efficiently, where you can essentially uh, get the data out and create, create an application on top of the knowledge graph that is providing sort of real-time access to the information to the end user, which, you know, it's very important, right, if you run these applications. Uh, this was some numbers that we ran in terms of trying to compare using Elasticsearch with Virtuoso. Someone mentioned Virtuoso earlier. Uh, so we played around quite a bit with Virtuoso and stuff. Uh, so this was a data set that had 1.2 billion triples in it. I think now we estimate for the human trafficking we have about 3 billion triples in the knowledge graph. Um, and uh, the average query times are all reported here in milliseconds. And so we, we actually did Virtuoso here, but we also did it as a, as a cluster. Uh, and it, it really didn't perform better for us as a cluster, though we did help Virtuoso debug their cluster version of their, their system. Uh, is there a reason why you did not use uh, the native uh, graph plugin for Elasticsearch? They have their own plugin for graph DB, so. I do not know the answer to that question. I'm not sure. Uh, but you can see here, so this is for the Elasticsearch road, we have just standalone Elasticsearch a cluster with five nodes and a cluster with 20 nodes. And then each of these columns correspond to the different types of searches or different types of queries that we needed to do from the interface for the system. So a keyword search, faceted search, uh, click search, and so on. Um, and you can see that you know, Elasticsearch greatly outperformed the virtual. So, uh, 
And here's another, just another data point here. So if we look at some of the uh, querying that we have to do for the performance in the uh, cyber domain, right? Where we're doing queries to predict cyber attacks. So here are some example queries, different types of queries, right? Average query time for keyword searches, which is eight milliseconds, right? And find, find a specific CVE, which is a specific vulnerability, 14 milliseconds. You know, get all the mentions of a particular Microsoft Bulletin and all the sources, 48 milliseconds. So the largest one here was a more complicated kind of aggregation to get all the document counts for each publisher and the, the document to the sensors which are making predictions was 409 milliseconds. So, I mean, the most expensive query in that set was less than half a second. Um, so it's very efficient. Okay, so now, I'm getting towards the end of my talk. I'm running out of time. Uh, let's come back to sort of the original questions that I, I brought up at the beginning since I uh, talked about them in, relate, in relation to the kinds of uh, technology problems we've uh, solved and the kinds of applications we've built. Okay, so let's start with, oh, so now I can sort of view these as sort of the lessons learned in terms of these things. All right, so first the question was, you know, where should the semantic web data come from? Uh, so I think the answer is pretty clear if you look at the applications we've built, right? It would say the web, because, you know, most of the data that we needed was not in the semantic web, right? It's not already stored out there in uh, uh, DBpedia. It comes from all of these different sources, and so a critical part of the problem for us then is, uh, how the information actually gets mapped into the semantic web to actually make use of it, right? So I'd say, you know, many people sort of have viewed the semantic web as sort of a, you know, okay, we can work with all this great data that's actually been mapped, and once it's mapped, we can use it, uh, but I think it's a mistake to think that way in the sense that, uh, you know, the rest of the world is going to move on uh, if the semantic web world sort of decides to sort of uh, look inward. Uh, second question was, okay, so what's the best representation of the data in the knowledge graph, right? You know, do you want the most detailed ontology possible for this? Many people, I think, also in this kind of our world, have this view that, okay, if we could just build, like, the, the, the greatest ontology for X, then we can then solve all the problems of X. And that will be, you know, everyone will be happy when people spend a lot of time building these very, very detailed ontologies about. But I would say what you really want is the simplest one that you need for the problem that you're actually trying to solve, right? So in my experience, right, with for example, with the AAC, the American Art Collaborative Project, uh, that's a really complicated ontology. The CVEX experiment is really complicated. We spent you know 18 months mapping the data to that ontology, and we finally figured out a good way to do it, you know, by creating some you know specific sort of templates and being able to validate that they map it correctly and stuff. Uh, but the people, what was interesting to me was that the people then building the application side of that project on top of it, the first thing they did was they wrote a set of Sparkle queries uh, to generate a much simpler set of data. Uh, because it was just, the data itself was just too complicated to use. Uh, so I would say, you know, these overly complicated ontologies that try to be comprehensive just get in the way of actually solving the problem. Right? And so if I contrast that to the ontology that we built for doing the, uh, the cyber knowledge graph, uh, which is a much, much simpler ontology built on schema.org. Uh, it took us a lot less time to map the data, uh, a lot less time to sort of map and refine it, and then the data was in the form that was more useful. Okay. Um, uh, third question was, you know, how should we deal with missing and incorrect information? This is a huge problem, right? So when you're dealing with all these online sources and stuff, uh, there's always going to be information that's missing. There's going to be information that's sort of incorrect, contradictory. Uh, you get multiple values for things, you don't know which one's the real value. Uh, so, I would say the lesson here is, well, you want to clean it where possible, because in many cases we do a lot of data cleaning on the data, uh, where we can you know, clean up formatting, all kinds of information. But at the same time, you have to assume that the problem's not going to go away. Right? And you can't assume that you're going to build your application and sort of say, oh, okay, we can link this information as long as we have all the common fields, because you're never going to have all the common fields across the information. Uh, so, you have to uh, solve the problem. Uh, you have to solve the problem. The fact that okay, in many of these applications, at least that we're building with real data, uh, you're going to need to build techniques that can deal with this. Right? And an example of that is sort of the the technique we did for collective entity resolution, which is actually addressing you know being able to link information when you have missing information or even contradictory. Uh, fourth question was, okay, how do we organize and store the data for efficient access? And I'm not saying that you would never want to use a triple store, but I would say you really want to use whatever data store that best meets the goal of the problem. 
And I think one thing that happens in the semantic web community is that there's this view that, okay, if you're not doing things in RDF and you're not storing your data in a triple store, then you're not really working on the semantic web. Uh, and I think that view is sort of misguided uh, in the sense that, well, we still care very much about the semantics of the data, and we still use the semantics of the data the and, and the techniques to build it and stuff. Uh, but what we found is using some of these other uh, data stores are give you a lot better ability to scale. Uh, so there's applications. So some of the applications we build, we do still use a triple store. I mean, if it's you know more contained, it doesn't have as much data, then it seems to work. Uh, but I think there's actually a view in the sort of a larger community. I've talked to many people in other projects I've worked on that sort of outside the semantic web say, oh yeah, we tried to use the semantic web stuff, but you know we just couldn't get it to scale. And stuff. Right. And so, you know, there's a danger for the semantic web community uh, in sort of tying themselves too close to sort of saying, okay, we have to use triple stores uh, because there's many applications and many users out there that would benefit from the same kind of technique, technology, uh, but uh, we have to, uh, I think, broaden the view that, okay, it doesn't have to be stored in a triple store to make it sort of part of the, uh, the semantic web. Uh, okay, so let me just conclude with sort of what I sort of, uh, based on my experience, are some of what I think are some really important directions for future research, uh, based on my own experience. One is, you know, techniques for extracting data from online sources. I mean, I think we've only really touched on the surface. We've worked on other kinds of things I didn't talk about today. Uh, but I think this is a really important uh, aspect, which is how do you get the information into whatever form it's in, into something that you can actually use it, right? So there's techniques for extraction from text information. We're working on another project where we're looking at extracting data out of raster maps, right? Where we're actually pulling the information uh, from historical maps and stuff. And, uh, and then we'll map it into a knowledge graph, create a knowledge graph with the data there. But extracting it's a, a key part of that problem. Uh, second one is approaches to essentially quickly build, refine, and extend uh, ontologies to solve specific problems. I mean, there aren't many tools out there where people have to, people spend a lot of time sort of saying, okay, we're going to build and publish this ontology, but there are not many uh, tools or much work on how do you actually create an ontology for a specific problem that you're trying to solve, right? And how do you sort of interact with it or find that? And we have done very little work on that, but I think it's a really important problem, one that we'd like to get to. Uh, the third one is methods for semantically annotating the data from the extracted sources. So this relates to the stuff we do karma. We don't think karma fully solves the problem with that. I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of being able to automatically do that semantic annotation. Uh, fourth one is uh, scalable and configurable techniques for entity res resolution. People have done a lot of work on entity resolution. And one of the, the big challenges in entity re resolution is that every problem is different. Okay, and so it's very hard to take sort of an existing tool and sort of say, okay, I'm just going to apply it to my problem. Uh, one of two things happens. Either it doesn't apply because somehow your problem is a little bit different than the assumptions they make in their tool, or the second thing that happens is that your data is much bigger than the one that the tool can actually handle. Uh, and so I think there's a real need to, to build better sort of, uh, techniques or libraries that can allow you to sort of take the problem that you need to solve and they can scale and address the problem. Uh, fifth one is, sort of highly scaled algorithms for querying and reasoning. So we've really only touched the surface in terms of the kinds of stuff we've been doing with uh, Knowledge Graph. I think that uh, there's a lot more reasoning we can do on top of the data. But one of the big challenges is how to make it scale, right? How to do it so that when you're dealing with really large data sets that you can uh, solve those. And then finally, this uh, ability to sort of publish and query semantic data on web pages. So right now, I mean, people publish data, right, uh, semantic data, in uh, triple stores behind Spark endpoints, which most people recognize don't work because as soon as they become popular and people use them, then they go down and they're no longer accessible. Uh, but if you look at what's happening in sort of the schema.org markup and the schema.org data that gets actually published on the web, I think there's a huge opportunity there because People are actually publishing tons of RDF data, right, embedded in web pages, right, using schema.org markup. Uh, so I think one interesting director of research is to sort of say, oh, okay, could we actually exploit that to build sort of a more general version of sort of the semantic web where uh, lots and lots of data is getting published that way, and you can just go and uh, aggregate that data by building some kind of crawler that goes out and searches it. So, okay, I think that's the. Thank you for listening and staying so late for the talk.
This, by the way, is a piece of art in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So those are all televisions there. Okay, so yeah, actually, I have a question that ties uh, several different things. That you go to the, la the slide one before this. Yep. So uh, then you talked about annotating uh, extracted sources, and then you talked about publishing, mm -hmm. and then earlier you talked about uh, errors and contradictions and things like that. And then you talked also about the human trafficking and being able to uh, explain some of the confusion. So my question to you is, so you have these uh, uh, data in the document and then you have the extracted data. Yep. Now how do you maintain traceability so that you can justify? No, that's a really great question. So I, I didn't really talk about that aspect, but one of the things we do in many of the applications is the, the traceability is key. And so one of the things we do is, as we're building the applications and mapping the data, we're including in the, in the data that's getting mapped in the knowledge graph sort of the links back to the original source information. So for example, like in the human trafficking domain, that's really important for law enforcement. They need to know exactly what page. And so that information, all those pages get stored on a server. There's a link back to this page. So in every piece of extracted information, it can always trace back to the original source of the data. And, and the same thing for the uh, data that we're uh, using for the cyber, uh, predicting cyber attacks. It turns out that one of the requirements of the program is to make sure that, okay, we can actually explain. If they, if they do a prediction, if we make a prediction about a particular cyber attack, then we have to be able to trace it all the way back to not just the individual pieces of information, but even the raw sources that it came from. And, and really, that just comes out to when you do the mapping of the data uh, that you're maintaining sort of the links back to the raw. And you can probably debug your extractors also in the process. Yeah, that's actually a really important point, which is that's a key part of the process, which is that you have to figure out when things don't work, why they don't work, and then go back. That's a very good question. Other questions? Yeah, over there. Hi, Craig. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I do have a question. Uh, so uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, I saw during the extraction process, uh, the work uses some domain ontology or some sort of a scheme, right? So how easy to uh, rectify the extraction if there is a change in the scheme? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now it's hard. So um, uh, it turns out that if you're, gonna, if you're gonna change the ontology and sort of do it in a monotonic way, so you're gonna add additional concepts, additional attributes, then it's not a problem. But if at some point you're you're trying to uh, do something, you say, oh, really, the way we've organized the the, uh, the classes and the properties domain isn't right. We need to reorganize it. Well, right now we have to go back and rebuild the mappings for the different data sources. And so it depends on the type of change. Okay. So sort of changes where you're adding additional information, that's really not a problem. You can just have them and then keep going. But ones where you want to reorganize things, that's a problem. And that's that's why this is one of the research questions. I think. So Sarasi. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you remember my class on the Tali and Symagix architecture. This is a question that goes, you know, way, way, way back, right? Because we would right. accept right. it from web sources and the schema would change, right? Yeah. yeah. And our own schema would change in terms of the way we model our, own, our knowledge base or project, whatever we call it. So uh, there are certain things where there are no clean theoretical answers, as simple as that. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I think the... Uh, all you have to, all you have is basically a flexible way to store the information and knowledge, and a flexible way to uh, create the mappings, and uh, the a, and a way to store the provenance or how things change over the period of time, right? So you had a second question. Yes. So the second one was. Uh, I saw uh, you use Twitter data for some of the work. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. The, the cyber domain. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we are also trying to use uh, Twitter data in the knowledge graph creation process. So what we see is it's a little hard to work with with text other than the other text because of the lack of the context. Yes. Do you have any specific experience that you want to share with us? Experience with what exactly? You mean in terms of? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Extracting the context. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we've used it in a relatively limited way. So we've been doing two things with Twitter data. 
One is uh, we look for specific references to, to certain cyber terms. So we look for, okay, are there tweets about different kinds of, uh, for example, if there's a particular kind of exploit out that has a name, you know, are people actually uh, tweeting about that? Uh, second is we look for types of uh, references to particular vulnerabilities, and those are usually used CDs. Uh, and those, okay. those are, th that information gets used uh, in terms of trying to figure out, okay, you know, is this, uh, are certain kinds of vulnerabilities stuff getting a lot of attention, right? The other way we use the Twitter data in that application is looking at uh, sentiment analysis, right? And trying to look at it with respect to specific companies. Because we're trying to figure out whether or not certain companies are going to be vulnerable to a cyber attack. Uh, and we tie that, and so we combine the Twitter information looking at sort of what are people actually saying about, not, not what are they actually writing about the company, but you know, are they, are there very negative or positive sentiments about the company? Uh, and then uh, uh, using that to try to figure out whether or not the company might be vulnerable. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so other questions? Okay, I know it's late. Thank you all for staying so late.